Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Supreme Court of Indiana is now in session. Please be seated. Good afternoon, welcome. What a joyful event in this historic courtroom. I'd like to um, introduce my colleagues at the bench. We have Justice uh, Mark Massa, Justice Robert Ruckard, and Justice Steve David, and thank you for coming. Today, um, we're going to celebrate the investiture, uh, Jeffrey Slaughter. He'll be introducing some of his family here in a minute, but I'd like to start by talking and letting you know some of the dignitaries that are here today. Starting with our hardworking Court of Appeals, we have Chief Judge Nancy Vadick, along with our colleagues John Baker, Edward Najem Jr., Mark Bailey, Melissa May, Margaret Robb, Paul Mathias, Michael Barnes, Terry Crone, Cale Bradford, Elaine Brown, Rudolph Pyle, and Robert Altice. We have tax court judge Martha Wentworth, and we're very pleased to have some senior judges here today, Judge Freelander, Fisher, and Sharpneck. We have friends from the federal bench that are joining us, um, Michael Caney, um, Judge David Hamilton, Judge John Tinder, Judge Robert Young, Judge Robert Jane Magnin Stinson, Judge Deborah McVicker Lynch, Judge Robin Moberly, and Judge James Carr. And just for the federal bench, I want, I know you're always worried about when you're gonna get out of these state court events, so we're about two. Um, <laughs> for those of you who've been to some federal court, you'll. Um, we have some of our former Supreme Court justices here, former Chief Justice Randall Shepard, Justice Frank Sullivan, Justice Ted Bohm and Justice Myra Selby, welcome. Also watching us for, uh, via live webcast, we have Justice Brent Dixon, and we have many of um, uh, Jeff Slaughter's friends and family throughout the Midwest that are also watching and able to participate with us by webcast today. We have some of the spouses of our spouses that are here. We have Julie Slaughter, and she's joined with Dr. Denise Rucker, Maureen Keefe, and Jim Rush. We're also joined by many distinguished state elected appointed officials, and thank you because I know you're all busy right now, and I appreciate you coming and joining in the celebration. From the executive and legislative branches, including Lieutenant Governor Eric Holcomb, Attorney General Greg Zeller, Superintendent Glenda Ritz, Auditor Suzanne Crouch, and Representative Eric Cook. We also have State Police Superintendent Doug Carter. Governor Pence could not join us today, but we thank him. So will you take, take a moment and thank him for his wise appointment of Jeffrey Slaughter. We also have two of the deans from our local law school, um, Dean Austin Parrish from IU Mauer, as well as Dean Andy Klein. And I do have to say, um, Dean Parrish, I'm glad to have, have another Bloomington Mauer graduate on our bench. Also, I do have a question for like this quadrant of the room. Is there any work being done at the Taft Law Firm today? <laughs> So will all the attorneys and the staff from this, um, for all the attorneys and staff that are here from the Taft, Satinaeus, and Hollister Law Firm, please stand. Thank you for sharing your colleague with us. Thank you. We also welcome to our Supreme Court family, um, Jeff brought his secretary, Robin. Um, Robin Ryan. So Robin is here today as well. I don't know if you stood when we introduced your former firm. I also want to take a minute to thank the members of the Judicial Nominating Commission that were able to come. I can tell you they put in many, many thoughtful hours and work with regard to getting the panel that went to Governor Pence. We have Lynette Long here today, David Tinky, and Rudy Eichem III, so thank you. So in today's ceremony, you'll he hear from each of our colleagues up here on the bench, and we're going to start with Justice David. Thank you, Chief. George Bernard Shaw once said, a happy family is but an earlier heaven. I share that with you because when I was asked to introduce the person who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Justice Slaughter's brother-in-law, I went to Justice Slaughter and I said, so tell me about your brother-in-law. And his face lit up. And that's a very good thing. Indeed, a happy family is but an earlier heaven. I'm pleased to introduce William Randolph III, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. He is Justice Slaughter's brother-in-law. Bill joins us today from Charlotte, North Carolina. He's a graduate of Ron Colley High School and the University of Indianapolis. He previously coached tennis at the University of Richmond, Clemson University, and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today, he's in medical sales based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. 
Mr. Mr. Randolph, sir, the courtroom is yours. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Randolph. Now I'll turn the program over to our partner, Justice Massa. Thank you, Justice David. Um, and welcome to all. As the Chief Justice noted, um, we are so honored today to have so many of our federal colleagues in our courtroom. And it is my privilege to introduce one of them today to present our new colleague. The Honorable Deborah McVicker Lynch has been a United States Magistrate Judge for the Southern District of Indiana since 2008. Um, as my evidence professor uh, Harvey would have said, she is able to testify today as a competent witness with firsthand knowledge. <laughs> as she worked alongside Justice Slaughter in private practice prior to taking the bench, and I invite her to the podium at this moment. Thank you. May it please the court, Chief Justice Rush, Justice Rucker, Justice David, Justice Massa, Lieutenant Governor Holcomb, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, and family of Justice Slaughter. When my dear friend first asked me uh, to speak at his investiture today, uh, he described that my charge would be to, quote, introduce him to the court. I found that a, a charming fiction, considering, <laughs> considering that he's been on the court for two months now. But the more I thought about it, uh, the more appropriate it seemed. And so I decided to embrace fully the task of introducing Justice Slaughter to his new colleagues on the court. But I won't spend time reciting the accomplishments including, included in his biography, though they demonstrate the aptness of his appointment. Rather, I believe I should approach the introduction of Justice Slaughter to his new colleagues with this observation in mind. It's an observation not original to me, but I've certainly seen its truth in my own experience. And that observation is that a court, uh, meaning the judges and staffs that serve the court, is a lot like a family. The working relationships among members of a court can take on the dynamics of a family, and members of that judicial family sometimes settle into various familial roles. And when a new member joins that family, the fine family dynamics and roles and relationships may shift a bit. So with that in mind, I would like to share with your honors some things you should know about your new brother. Uh, I've learned these things, as Justice Massa said, because I had the good fortune of working closely with Jeff at Summer Barnard, now tapped, from the time he joined the firm in 2001 until my appointment as a magistrate judge in 2008. Uh, and I've had the even greater good fortune of being his friend for the last 15 years. First, <clears throat> I think it's critical that I tell you right away about Brother Slaughter's strange affliction. I probably <laughs> should have contacted you sooner. When you circulate the draft of an opinion to him, do not be alarmed if he starts shaking and hyperventilating. It probably won't become a major medical emergency. Rather, it's just that your opinions are published in Times New Roman font. <laughs> <coughs> Justice Slaughter is keenly attentive to fonts. Well, actually, he is obsessed with fonts. <laughs> and Times New Roman is decidedly not his preferred font. <laughs> but in time, I expect that he will be able to adjust to this particular family custom. And indeed, it may ultimately uh, be a time saver to have such things institutionally established. If Justice Slaughter were choosing and policing your fonts, it would take hours and hours longer to prepare opinions for filing. 
Those chuckles are from his former colleagues who know exactly what I am talking about. You've no doubt noticed in the two months since Justice Slaughter joined your family that he is unfailingly courteous, generous, and considerate. He assumes the best about everybody. This is not temporary. He's not simply on his best behavior in his new professional home. This is who he is. The two of us have had some spirited debates over the years just as I expect you will around your conference room table. And make no mistake, he is passionate in his opinions. But I've never known anyone who disagrees more agreeably. Now there are just a couple of exceptions to these attributes though that you should know about, that will, things that will raise his ire. Uh, poor performance uh, by the IU football team or by his beloved Cubs. <laughs> Uh, or a knucklehead driver of a car in close proximity. By the way, Justice Slaughter routinely uses old-timey words like knucklehead. <laughs> if you've not yet talked sports with him or been a passenger in his car, or witnessed him holding forth on something he's passionate about, then you may be wondering how you will even be able to tell when Justice Slaughter is angry or excited so I'll offer you some signs to watch for. A dramatic increase in words uttered per minute, uh, waving arms and hands and wide eyes. Lawyers who argue before this court take note, that sort of reaction to your argument may not bode well for you. <laughs> Most of us probably have that family member who spend thrift ways cause friction in the family. That will not be Justice Slaughter. He is frugal. If you pass his office at two o'clock in the afternoon and his lights are out, don't assume he's left early. It probably means he just stepped across the hall for a drink of water. Even a 30-second absence merits his shutting down the power. So, uh, you will not need to guard the court checkbook with Brother Slaughter. What you may need to guard, however, is your lunch. <laughs> he loves and appreciates good food, so if you share a refrigerator, label any especially tasty leftovers clearly. Let me wrap up my family analogy by addressing one other topic that's important to families, and that's in-laws, those people who become part of your family by marriage. This court is getting, in Julie Slaughter, the dream in-law. She's delightful, smart, funny, and kind. I know that any gatherings of your family that she attends will be enlivened by her presence. When I first learned of Jeff's appointment to the court, I jumped for joy. I do not mean this figuratively. It would have been no big deal had I been at home or even in my office, but it did cause some stares at Men's Warehouse in Castleton, <laughs> where, where I'd taken my son to choose his wedding attire. That joy is a personal one, of course, because Jeff is a dear friend. But my elation over his appointment goes way beyond that. As a 30-year member of the Indiana Bar, and as a judge uh, frequently called upon to apply Indiana law, I take great pride in the quality and reputation of our Supreme Court. An appellate judgeship, it seems to me, is a marriage of independent thought, analysis, research, and writing on the one hand, and productive collaboration with similarly prepared colleagues on the other. Justice Slaughter is a perfect fit. He is an accomplished thinker and writer. He loves law. He loves policy. He loves language. He loves people. He thrives in civil conversation and exchange with his colleagues and other lawyers. 
he will be a terrific 109th Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. Thank you, Judge Lynch. I'm going to ask Julie and Jeff to approach the podium. My colleagues and I will be coming down for the oath. Julie will be holding the family Bible during the oath ceremony, and you'll hear more um, about the slaughters later in the ceremony. But Julie is a graduate of Roncalli High School, University of San Diego, and the McKinney School of Law, former assistant deputy mayor of neighborhoods for the city of Indianapolis, and most recently served 10 years as a public defender in Marion County. We will be coming down there to administer the oath. All rise. Slaughter, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Indiana, and the Constitution of the State of Indiana, and that I will faithfully and impartially, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge my duties, discharge my duties as a Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court, as a Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. To the best of my skill and ability, to the best of my skill and ability. So help me God. So help me God. You'll get faster. <laughs> and that was Ju Justice Slaughter's cousin, Bill Bailey, who brought up the Dishel Rove, a longtime, lifelong resident of Ogden Dunes, works in Chicago, and works at a real estate investment company. So thank you for, for being involved in the roving. All rise.
now be back in session. Please join me in welcoming the 109th Justice Jeffrey Slaughter. I'm going, I've invited Justice Robert Rucker to introduce um, Justice Slaughter before his initial comments. But, you, but let's look at Justice Rucker. Justice Rucker has worked with eight Supreme Court justices and 23 judges on the Court of Appeal. So congratulations, Justice Rucker. And I'm pleased to have you introduce our newest justice. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Slaughter and I share a hometown. He was born in Gary. I was not, although I got there as soon as I heard about it. And that is where I grew up. So I joined him in welcoming the many guests from the region who are here joining us today. Thank you. Have you heard Justice Slaughter attended Indiana University, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts in Economics, graduating with high honors. He later received a Master's of Business Administration in Finance from the Kelly School of Business and his Juris Doctorate, cum laude, from IU's Mora School of Law. He clerked for Chief Judge Alan Sharp of the United States District Court of the Northern District of Indiana, uh, South Bend, I'm sorry. He then worked in private practice in Chicago and later as special counsel to the Indiana Attorney General. Most recently, you may applaud Mr. Attorney General. <laughs> <laughs> Most recently, Justice Slaughter was a partner with, as you heard, with the Taft Law Firm litigating complex business disputes in both federal and state courts. He is a strong supporter of civic education, having since 1966 volunteered as a judge for the We the People competition. Finally, it should come as no surprise that Jeff is a strong fan of both the Chicago Cubs and the Indiana Hoosiers football team. Won't you again join me in welcoming the Honorable Jeffrey G. Slaughter, the 109th Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. Thank you, Justice Rucker, and my thanks to all of you. I'm grateful to the many elected officials, fellow judges, court staff, friends, and family here today. Uh, you honor me with your presence. Um, allow me to begin by thanking Governor Pence for entrusting me with the privilege of serving as a member of our state's highest court. I, I hope that his appointment of me will come to be viewed favorably uh, by those who consider his legacy in leading our great state. The Judicial Nominating Commission plays a central role in selecting our appellate judiciary. Several commission members are here today. Uh, all of you have my thanks for the important work that you do. I'm also grateful to many friends and colleagues who supported my appointment. And I thank the many talented men and women, uh, lawyers and judges both, who applied to succeed Justice Brent Dixon. Uh, justice Dixon was our court's 100th justice and has left huge shoes to fill. As I mentioned during the governor's announcement in May, no one can replace Justice Dixon. I'm merely succeeding him. And in doing so, I'm mindful of his enormous legacy, not just the quantity of his service. His 30 years on this court make him our second longest serving member, but also its quality. He's truly a gentleman and scholar, and one whose tenure has been marked by commitment to professionalism and civility. Before he became chief in 2012, Justice Dixon was a member of what my generation of lawyers calls the Shepherd Court, consisting of Chief Justice Randy Shepherd, Justice Dixon, Justice Frank Sullivan, Justice Myra Selby, and Justice Ted Bohm, uh, later joined in 1999 by my colleague, Justice Robert Rucker. Now, for 11 years, Justice Rucker occupied what is now my seat on the bench and around our conference table, the one to the Chief Justice's immediate left 
spatially, if not philosophically, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is reserved for the newest justice. Um, the Shepherd Court had a well-deserved national reputation for excellence, and it's setting a very, very high bar for themselves. They necessarily set it high for those of us privileged to follow them. Now, that lineup of justices would not change until 2010, when Justice Bohm retired and was succeeded by Justice David. In 2012, Justice Massa succeeded his mentor, Chief Justice Shepard, and then Justice Rush, Rush succeeded Justice Sullivan. And with my appointment this year, 80% of the court has now turned over in just six years. As Justice Rucker noted, I'm a Lake County boy, born in Gary and grew up in Crown Point. I was fortunate to be raised in a family and a community committed to learning and a first-rate public education. My dear mother, who was a saint, grew up in a church family. She was the daughter of a Methodist minister and served as the church organist. She'd later become a school teacher and librarian. She was a kind, lovely lady who never raised her voice but lived life with dignity, a quiet strength, and a deep commitment to her family, church, and community. Now, in some ways, my father was her polar opposite. <laughs> he was often loud because he didn't hear well and highly opinionated. He was a tobacco-using, bourbon-drinking, poker-playing 20-something when he began courting my mother. He wasn't an obvious suitor for the pastor's daughter, but she saw past these vices and recognized him as the wonderful husband and father that he would become. He was one of the brightest men I've ever known. He never finished college and had no interest in following his own father into the practice of law. But he was an avid reader and self-taught, and he did his own thing. He was a farmer, steel worker, electrical whiz, inventor, and entrepreneur before he settled into his life's work as a newspaper man for more than 35 years. He'd correct if you, he would correct you if you called him a journalist because he never spent a day in journalism school. Although both my parents are now deceased, I'm here today because of the, their love and commitment to their only child, who was born in 1962, 14 years after they tied the knot in 1948. And on my father's side, I'm an only grandchild. My dad's younger sister, my Aunt Beth, never married. She's 94 and still lives in Crown Point. Now, fortunately, my mother's family was more prolific. <laughs> my mom's younger brother, my Uncle Bob, who's 90 years old, is the ba Bailey family patriarch. He's unable to be here today, but he's watching live from his home in Valpo. And for all his success in business and his commitment to many civic and charitable causes, he's most proud of his wonderful family. Uncle Bob and Aunt Sarah had three boys, my cousins John, Bill, and Jim, and I'm honored that many of their families are here today. John and Jan Bailey of Chicago were planning to attend but had a family emergency. Bill and Deb Bailey of Ogden Dunes are here, along with their son Rob Bailey and his fiancée Jackie Ballou of Chicago, and their other son, Russ Bailey of Crown Point. Russ's wife Jessica couldn't be here today. Sadly, we lost my cousin Jim way too young. His wife, Chris Bailey of Ogden Dunes, is here, and so is their daughter, Leslie Marlatt of, Ma of Manchester, Indiana. Leslie's husband, Adam, is a school teacher and coach and couldn't be here, and neither could Jim and Chris's daughter, Lauren. She and her husband, Brock, are school teachers in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, and their son, Jordan Bailey, and his wife, Emily, just moved to Bloomington, from Bloomington to Atlanta and can't be here. I'm delighted, however, that Deb's mother, Helen Owens, is here from Portage, but we miss Deb's sister, Sandy Cieslik, and her husband, Chris of Ogden Dunes, who can't be here. Now, my wife's family, the Randolphs, are also well represented. The family patriarch is my father-in-law, William Randolph, Jr. He was born in the Jim Crow South and raised in Charlottesville. His hometown, University of Virginia, didn't admit African Americans in that era, so he attended what was then Hampton College and now Hampton University. He joined the Army just as President Truman was desegregating the military. With the formal institutional obstacles removed, he used his smarts and his wits, and he rose to the rank of lieutenant colonel. He served multiple tours in Korea and Vietnam and was awarded two Purple Hearts and a Bronze Star. He's a hero to his country as well as his family, and Pop, I couldn't be pr more proud to be part of your family. I'm honored that you're here today.
Sadly, just this year, Bill lost his wife, Barb, of 62 years. They raised three children, Renee, Bill III, and Julie. Renee and her husband, John, run a catering business in San Francisco and can't be here. You met Bill when he led the Pledge of Allegiance. He's the brother I never had. And then there's Julie, my dear wife, the baby of the family. Julie and I met in the Attorney General's office. Former Attorney General Pam Carter hired me. She was a true trailblazer as the first woman and first African American to serve in that office. Pam is the reason I came to Indianapolis, and her successor, Jeff Modisette, is the reason I stayed. Jeff hired Jules out of FSSA, where she had served as an assistant to Cheryl Sullivan, who was secretary, and the better half of former justice and now Professor Frank Sullivan. <laughs> now, some of you have heard this story. Julie had wanted to go out and invited me to lunch one day. I accepted her invitation, but was planning to tell her that I was flattered by her interest, but no thanks. Um, <laughs> I, I just left another relationship, really wasn't looking to date again right away, and I especially didn't want to go out with somebody I was working with. I figured no good could come from that. <laughs> During our lunch, I mostly listened. The truth is I couldn't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> By the time we got back to work, um, I was hooked. Julie turned out to be smart and personable and had a wonderful sense of humor. And if that wasn't enough, she was also a Cubs fan and rooted for IU football. <laughs> At least that's what she told me. So, <laughs> so we started dating. In about 18 months, we were engaged. Six months later, we were married in this very courtroom where Justice Sullivan officiated. His wife, Cheryl, was our maid of honor. And I told Justice Sullivan at the time that I'd had a couple of oral arguments under my belt in his court by then, but that I'd never been more nervous than I was that day, um, <laughs> until perhaps today. Um, in January, uh, we celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary. I've been truly blessed to have Julie in my life. She's my partner and best friend. She means the world to me, and I wouldn't be here without her. As an aside, Justice Sullivan was on the court when I argued my first case here in 1996. Uh, we were married in this courtroom five years later, and I'm honored that he's here today on this special occasion. I'm also honored that several longtime friends from Crown Point and Northwest Indiana are here today. It's wonderful to see all of you. My friends are here from IU and Briscoe Quad. It's hard to believe it's been 35 years since we matriculated as freshmen. <coughs> I have many friends and classmates from IU's Maurer School of Law, including faculty members and our dean. I'm, I'm grateful for the first-rate legal education I received there and my thanks to all of you for being here. Coincidentally, Julie graduated from McKinney the same year that I graduated from Maurer. Although I'm not a McKinney alum, I've come to know many of its faculty members, including its dean, who's also an avid Cubs fan. Dean, I think this is our year. <laughs> I had the privilege of serving two years as a law clerk to Judge Alan Sharp in South Bend. Uh, Judge Sharp taught me a lot about the law and about life. He was a character. Uh, they broke, broke the mold with him but he was also a true mentor and friend. He's been gone seven years now. Several former colleagues from Judge Sharp's chambers got together just a couple weeks ago in Brown County where the judge grew up. We laughed a little and cried a little and shared a lot of fond memories. <clears throat> I'm also pleased to welcome several colleagues from the Attorney General's office. It was a wonderful six years. We had a good run and several, several have remained very good friends. I'm also honored to have many friends and colleagues from Taft here today. They recruited me out of the AG's office 15 years ago. <clears throat> a wonderful partnership, personally and professionally. Uh, you've heard from my dear friend, Debbie Lynch, who's a former Taft lawyer. Not only was I blessed with a, an interesting and sophisticated legal practice, but I got to work with colleagues who are first-rate lawyers and people, and I'm grateful. <clears throat> Several additional friends are here from various legal, political, academic and intellectual communities in Bloomington, Chicago, and Indianapolis. Over the years, I've been inspired by your leadership and buoyed by your friendship. And to all of you, I say thank you. And finally, I'm grateful to my new colleagues on the bench. Uh, you've all been so kind and welcoming. I appreciate your patience as I scale the learning curve, the steep learning curve of moving from private practice to the bench. Now, some in the audience may not have realized that um, all of my colleagues were smart enough to get to this court on their first try. Um, me, it took a little while longer. Um, but I'm delighted and honored to be here, and I look forward to many years of service together. And my thanks to all of you.
Deb, I, I was checking out his font, and I've not seen the hands yet, so <laughs> how's that? The beauty, uh, this room is fantastic. We've got uh, the, the pictures of 107 of the, those that have come before us. And the, the longer we're on the court, the, the more we hear about the stories, and they all have a story. They all have blend together to kind of to, to weave the ri rich tapestry that we have um, of the Indiana Supreme Court. So joining um, this collage of pictures, and we are just looking for two pictures, Justice Johnson, who's the other one, Chief Justice Shepard, who, who else are we missing up here? We need to offer a reward if somebody can find a picture of our first, actually it was Chief Judge, they were called Judge before Justices, was Johnson. Uh, we do not have his picture, and we have another one that we don't have earlier. We're looking for them. I went down to his grave site, and I asked the whole people in his community, I offered something, I don't know what, but uh, maybe we can get those pictures. But added to this collection, this historical collection, we'll be adding Justice Slaughter's picture. So at this time, I would ask Julie to come forward and unveil the picture of the 109th Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. some uh, conclusionary remarks, but we're blessed in Indiana to have just both a strong and a solid, sound judiciary. And that's been the case for many years because of the many that came before us. And you're sitting right there in the front row. The foundation that you built of this court that we get the honor of shepherding right now it, it is amazing. So thank you for that foundation, Chief Justice Shepard, Justice Sullivan, Justice Bohm, and Justice Selby. Today we get to publicly welcome Jeff as 109th Justice. You may not realize, and he talked about it in a little of his comments, but there was really one of the happiest people in this room was, guess who? Justice Massa. One fe feature of our court is he got to scoot over and Justice Slaughter uh, gets to vote first on the cases as he was doing all morning. We had cases, we had conference this morning for a while. Um, he has to dis explain his legal rationale, and then we go around the table. And sometimes we go around the table a couple of times, and then we go back around the table. Um, but he does get to go first. And I know you're appreciative of that, Mark. He even said, uh, he even said that this morning. He goes, oh, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm here. Um, and we have to just really look at Justice Rucker, because he did hold the historical record of being in the first justice, sitting there voting on every case every week for 11 years. So he will tell you there are no passes, correct? I think I tried to get a pass once. You did. I did. Work. And he said, no. <laughs> no passes. So, Jeff, it's been a pleasure getting to know you and Julie. Uh, my husband and son got to go to a Cubs game with you, and they did tell you tell, that, tell me that it was quite the experience, and it made it a lot more fun going with you um, <laughs> on that. So she really is a Cubs fan. It's not just fake. They're not playing to the audience on that. Um, and she herself, I mean, Julie just has an extensive background in law, and I'm really impressed by her tour of duty with the Marion County Public Defender's Office, as well as working at the Attorney General. You, you truly have a heart for justice, so thank you for bringing that to the court. The vetting process of appointing a new justice is a robust one. Um, the Judicial Nominating Commission, we met for hours, pouring over 30 applications. You could probably fill the room with the pages um, that we read, calling candidates, checking references, interviewing um, the interview process, and there were many outstanding candidates. But Jeff's almost three decades of experience practicing law and what he brought to the table just made him very qualified. He's an excellent writer with an attention to detail, has a fantastic work ethic and a passion for law. In short, he brings a lot to our conference table. So who is he? Who is this Justice 109? He shared some with you today. We were talking about the comments. I said, let him get to know you. Um, our court was familiar with Jeff's work because he appeared before this court where he was able to field questions like an Olympian. I mean, we could throw them at him and he could get it right back. Um, but to really understand his character, I couldn't think of a better way than to share with you some of the words of testimony from letters of recommendation that we received, that we poured over as we were looking at him. 
I'm just going to quote from some of them. Jeff is an equal part scholar, practitioner, and informed citizen. In this era of increasing incivility, Jeff stands out as a model of professionalism and courtesy. A young lawyer wrote to us, Jeff has been a great mentor, and he was and is a great team player. Another wrote, he gives generously of his time and talent to attorneys in the community at large. We heard from fellow pra appellate practitioners that allowed that he would moot their oral arguments. I've seen him judge junior high students on the We the People. He's been president and leadership of our Indiana Bar Foundation that takes on a lot um, of the projects we do to, to help our profession. Another person wrote, whenever I was working on a tough issue, Jeff is the one I turned to for advice. He can take the most complicated situation and break it down into its component parts and describe them in plain language. We're counting on that. And finally, he is humble to a fault. To say that the five of us spent a lot of time together is an understatement. Most Thursdays we're in conference discussing, and at times I'd say rather energetically, lawn cases. Our offices are next to each other or across the hall from each other. This allows us to drop in or visit or discuss a case or administrative issue informally on a regular basis. Team chemistry is absolutely crucial for us to function properly. And that can often be the biggest unknown when you get a new member. It's not that we always agree. It's, it's not that we don't have intellectual exchanges on where the law is, what it says, but that chemistry is important. We had that team chemistry with Justice Brent Dixon. And in working with Jeff over the past eight weeks, I'm pleased to report that it appears that that chemistry will remain intact. The state of Indiana and your Supreme Court is well positioned for the future with this appointment. We'll work hard to continue as a court that is nationally recognized for our collegiality, efficiency, and sound decision making. So please join me in one final welcome of Jeffrey Slaughter, the 109th Justice. <laughs> invite you to join us in a reception and there's also a guest book if you'd like to leave a message for Justice Slaughter. Sheriff Miller. All rise. This court is adjourned. <laughs>